All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, indoor virtual meeting, November 20th. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, our topic tonight, uh, we're gonna get to see some uh, great images from our rack imaging group, our uh, several folks in the group who uh, do imaging. Let's see what they've got uh, done recently. Chris Cole is gonna uh, coordinate uh, or maybe be showing the images himself. I'm not sure how that's gonna work, but I'll, I'll let him uh, describe that. Uh, after that, uh, after we go through that, we'll uh, take a, a, a brief uh, break and then we'll uh, conduct our business meeting. We have a few items on our business meeting we want to go over. Uh, if you have any questions, instead of uh, interrupting the speaker, please post them to the chat and I will uh, ask the speakers once they're uh, done doing their uh, showing their images. Okay, can everybody hear me well? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, I guess the best way to do this as far as uh, who's going to be uh, presenting tonight is that uh, uh, I guess like throw up, raise your hand and uh, we'll get to you as uh, um, as everybody uh, uh, will basically we'll create a lineup um, if you uh, raise your hand and I'll just hand it off to the next person after after uh, the, uh, the person who's speaking is done. So again, um, you can show as many images as you want, but just keep in mind that the uh, whole point of, uh, or excuse me, we like to uh, get everybody's, uh, um, to give, give everybody a chance to show their own images. So uh, when you're showing your images, try to keep your uh, um, individual presentation 10 minutes or less. So uh, anyway, um, just uh, use the raise your hand, I guess, uh, Command that's at the bottom of the uh, participants uh, window. I believe that's it right there. Uh, for example, I just uh, raised my hand, uh, but uh, uh, that's how we'll do it. So um, I guess I'll start off uh, right now and um, I'll share my screen. Am I, am I able to share? Uh, you should be. Okay, well, I just want to know. I'm, I'm about to start. Yeah, you should be able to share. Okay, very good. My pictures will work. Okay. Uh, share screen. Photos. Share. Okay, everybody see that? Okay, so the first I have up here is this is uh, a section of the uh, uh, constellation Aurea. It's uh, sort of like in between the horns of the constellation of uh, Taurus or just above the horns of the constellation Taurus. So what you're seeing here is a uh, nebula complex um, right here to the uh, um, right. That's called the Flaming Star Nebula. And then down here, um, this, uh, these are known as the, uh, uh, or this actually whole area is called the uh, Tadpoles Nebula. And uh, an official name for that one, or a serial number, catalog number, whatever, however you want to call it, is from the IC catalog. It's called well, IC410. Um, I don't know what the Flaming Star uh, uh, Nebula's uh, uh, catalog number is, but, uh, but basically what you're seeing here, this is an H alpha image of H alpha and uh, an oxygen image of the area, and uh, it's just meant to uh, mimic the uh, uh, what it would look like uh, in uh, visible light if your eyes were actually sensitive enough to pick up hydrogen alpha wavelengths, which would appear in the red. So next, here is uh, the actual uh, section right there, down there in the middle, the uh, tadpole nebula. Here's a close-up of it, and uh, this isn't just hydrogen oxygen narrowband filters that we're seeing here. We're seeing uh, narrowband filters uh, with uh, hydrogen alpha assigned to green and then uh, oxygen assigned to uh, blue. And then the final filter is uh, sulfur two. So narrowband filters are really, uh, filter imaging is really nice. The caveat is you need really long exposures and you need uh, good, a good stable mount to uh, be able to uh, uh, 
take such images uh, because the biggest advantage that out narrow band imaging is that you uh, can do this uh, under light pollu polluted skies fairly easily. So anyway, so if you had a tadpole nebula, that's what these little things up here are called, the tadpoles. Got some uh, um, uh, dark nebulae right here. This is just basically dust that's being silhouetted by the uh, emission gas behind it. And then this is something um, I did like during the early days of the pandemic, since we all could just make our own uh, work hours. So uh, what I did is I got up in the AM hours and I started taking images of a section of uh, the Cygnus uh, constellation right there. That's the star to Neb. So um, let's see, maybe I can zoom in here a little bit. Um, so there we go. So yeah, there's that's the Neb right there. Down here you got the uh, the Pelican Nebula, the North American Nebula. Then up here, uh, that's an SH object right here. It's uh, pretty, uh, uh, it's imaged a lot. So <laughs> I'll just say that. Then over here, this is the Propeller Nebula. Almost looks more like the rudder of a of a boat. So I would probably call it a rudder nebula. Then down here, this is the star Seder, which is the center star of the cross that makes uh, the constellation Cygnus. And right here, you got this nice, beautiful bar of a uh, of a dark nebula, uh, just a thick cloud of dust, uh, again, being silhouetted by the light uh, from the emission nebulae there in front of it. And then right here is a popular uh, uh, object to image. This is called a crescent nebula. So we got that, and let's see. I think that's pretty much it. Steve Christensen, he'll be showing uh, an image of this area. It's it's huge. He uh, he took it uh, several more steps uh, forward than I did. So, but anyway, yeah. So that's uh, uh, this whole area is uh, was taken with an 85 millimeter lens. And just to uh, give you some scale, this is uh, what the moon would look like had I used the same uh, camera and lens. So it's a really big area. So a full moon would only take up this much area of this huge nebula complex. So there's that. And let's see what we got now. Okay, so here's the Crescent Nebula. That was uh, right over here. So here's a close-up of it. I used the same color scheme as I did with the uh, Flame Nebula and Tadpole uh, Nebula back here. So let's see. So so yeah, Crescent Nebula, this was taken, and this is also a narrow band image, uh, along with this one. This was the all three filters, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. This one was just uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Now what's uh, kind of neat to uh, note in this image is that down here on the lower left corner, there was a uh, planetary nebula that was actually discovered by an amateur imager. And you can just barely see it right here. It's this, uh, this little circle right here. And it had never been found before until an amateur found it. So that's a planetary nebula. Basically, it's uh, a star that's similar to our sun and it's just uh, dissolved and just slowly venting its uh, uh, outer shells out into space. So here you go. That's a crescent nebula, also known as NGC 6888. Uh, uh, this is a semi-okay image of uh, Mars. Uh, the biggest uh, objective I had for uh, taking an image of Mars uh, uh, this time around when it um, approached opposition was try to get this little land formation that's really popular called uh, Sirtis Major. Uh, not very good with uh, land formations or the geography of, uh, of uh, Mars, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, paintings and whatnot uh, uh, depict this uh, uh, surface area of Mars. And then, of course, up here, you got a faint uh, look at the polar caps. So planetary imaging in uh, North Carolina skies is kind of tricky because uh, the seeing has to be absolutely pristine to get good images. And so this night was with, not without bad seeing. <laughs> so anyways, uh, that was taken with the schmidt cassegrain and C11 right there, whereas uh, most of these other pictures, they were with uh, refractors and camera lenses. So, But that one was with the schmidt cassegrain and of course, uh, what happened uh, when we, uh, when we were all on lockdown for the most part, uh, we had a nice uh, visitor to come and light up the night sky in the morning. And then later on at night, Comet Neowise, uh, this is over at my uh, uh, in-law's farm just across the street from us and uh, at their strawberry farm. And thought it made a nice little scenic look there, although I wish my Honda Civic wasn't there. So, oh well. 
And then finally, uh, this is a sunspot group that uh, appeared about two weeks ago. And uh, you have, uh, uh, what I have here is I took uh, two, uh, three filtered images of that sunspot on the surface of the sun. And uh, this is taken in using a white light filter and another, um, uh, a white light filter that most people would use just to visually look at the sun, but I also slapped in another filter called a continuum filter. Uh, it's uh, uh, it detects the wavelength at five, uh, 540 nanometers, which is actually more in the green than it is yellow. But you know, this is false color, so you can make it whatever your uh, color you want. And yellow is the most common color used for uh, uh, the uh, uh, continuum filter, which, like I said, is more on the green side. So, but anyway, yeah, you got all this nice granular around it too. And then over here. This one, you probably notice how the granulae or the uh, surface uh, features here are a little bit blurred. That's because this is a higher uh, frequency uh, filter right here, 393. So it's getting close to UV and higher frequency wavelengths do not uh, uh, penetrate through the atmosphere as easily. If they did, uh, well, we probably would all have skin cancer right now because of the UV getting through. But uh, this is the calcium K line. It looks at the uh, calcium um, uh, photons of uh, whatever activity on the on sun is activating it. And then finally over here, probably the most popular wavelength is uh, uh, hydrogen alpha and gives the most dynamic look of what's going on on the sun here. And if you look at this carefully, you can kind of see how this area looks like, like uh, what you would see in middle school science books. It looks like a bar magnet. And you can see the magnetic field lines emanating on either side of uh, the sunspot group. So, yeah, just keep in mind that the sun is pretty much just a mass of melted atoms, per se. So it's just a bunch of boiling electrons and protons, and, well, its magnetic field is chaotic. It's not just, you know, go from north to south like here on Earth. It's all over the place. So, so anyway, yeah, so those are all the images I have. Um, I guess, uh, does anybody have a quick question? Just, uh, I don't know how you would do that. Um, is my 10 minutes up? Let me ask that. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, no one's, uh, uh, Leticia says, my daughter says the orange one has hair in it. Oh, uh, yeah, I could see that. That's the nicest thing about, uh, uh, astro imaging or just astronomy in general. You, you can play what I like to term cloud with it. You look at clouds in the sky and say that one looks like a donkey or whatever, but yeah, I can see it. Yeah. It looks nice and fuzzy. So if we could actually lay on it, it would probably feel like a cushion, right? <laughs> Where we get vaporized, of course. Okay, anybody else? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so yeah, we got the hands raised right there. I guess, uh, Steve, you can take it from there. Um, and uh, Or actually, I'm talking to you, Stephen Blake. <laughs> uh, you can call on the next person. Uh, I... Uh... I don't see any hands. Uh, is there? Okay. Well, oh, I see Steve Goodman's got his hand up. Yeah. You want to go ahead, Steve? You're muted. Steve, you're Steve Goodman. You're muted. It's Steve Goodman. You are. Mu there you go. Ah, uh, there we go. Wrong button. We'll try to follow up Chris's with the with these more simple, mundane things that I have. Uh, let me see if I can figure out how to share what I need to share here. All right, we'll just share the screen. Uh, you cannot move the video while someone has their hand raised. All right, can you see? Uh, something, yeah, there we go. Okay, this, this is a picture I took of the double cluster uh, back about the beginning of, uh, of November, um, this image was taken through my four and a quarter uh, f5.6 reflector on top of the uh, uh, Alt the Atlas EQG that I run. Uh, let me look right quick. I forgot how many images I put in here. This was uh, 45 nine, 90 second images uh, that were stacked together using. Uh, uh, pixel processor and then tweaked a little bit with affinity photo. So uh, uh, one night of imaging out on this one. Uh, so now let me go on to the next one here if I can figure out where it is. Mm. 
the screens in the way. Hang on, let me move this out of the way so I can get to the, okay. Here's the next one that I've got. This one was taken, I think, in August. This is M15. Um, this is the Pegasus cluster. Uh, this one was taken with my 8-inch F6. Uh, and this has, uh, this has 39 three-minute photos stacked again using pixel processor and tweaked in infinity. Uh, and again, the, the uh, telescope is riding on top of the, the Orion Atlas that I have. Uh, all of these were taken from my driveway backyard area, sort of in uh, uh, just north of Raleigh, near the corner of Six Forks and 540. Uh, this is M27. This was taken back earlier in the year. Uh, and again, this is about 35 by uh, three minute frame stacked up, uh, taken with uh, the eight inch F6. And this is probably the last one that I've worked on. This is, this was taken this week uh, using the four and a quarter inch uh, uh, F5.6. Uh, this is Pleiades, by the way. I, I guess I should be telling you what all of those were. There were the double cluster and Pegasus. And the previous one to this was M27 of the Dumbbell Nebula. This is the Pleiades cluster, or M45, and this is about 100 uh, three-minute photos stacked, uh, or about a total of five hours of integration uh, uh, taken Monday night and Wednesday night here at the house. So, uh, questions? I'll go ahead and stop at this point so we can go to the next one unless I need to come back to something, so. Uh, yeah, Chris asked if that was the scope you built yourself. Yes, it is. That is the scope that I built this summer. The four, the four and a quarter F5.6, yes. Looks like you did a good job. You, uh, uh, could you say more about it? The way it's turned out. Could you say more about it? Barton asked. Yeah, well, it's a uh, uh, classic Newtonian. Uh, four and a quarter inch uh, 5.6 gives it about a 600 millimeter focal length. Uh, uh, I built, I made the mirror, ground the mirror here in the shop and uh, had it coated up at Majestic Coatings uh, up in Virginia. I think it's Majestic in Virginia. Uh, came back and we found out I didn't quite polish it out quite as well as I should have, but it looks like after taking the photos and stuff, it's good enough until I'm not gonna worry about going back and redoing it at this point. It uh, seems to be performing well. Uh, the tube is an octagonal tube that I made just out of a bunch of scrap oak laying out here in the shop. I, I stripped it up into two inch pieces and put eight strips around it so that I, so it's an octagonal tube that's about just under 30 inches long at this point. Uh, the, uh, I, had a, I had a secondary mirror, a one and a half inch secondary that had come out of the, the eight and a half when I did some upgrades to it. So I went to Astro Systems and bought a, a secondary holder from Astro Systems and mounted the, the one and a half inch secondary from the old Mead that I had uh, in the thing and, and then uh, uh, put, a, put a bar on it so I could mount it on the scope and then drilled a couple of holes in it so I could mount the guide scope uh, directly to it. And it hangs off of the, hangs off the mount pretty well. And, uh, and these are the, like the second or third images I've taken with it. And, and so far, what I've seen out of it, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how it works. Uh, there's, a, there's a build article that I put out on Cloudy Nights uh, that's got a, a handful of pictures of the stuff that I did for it that I'll post up here when I can find it in the, in the chat box. I'll post a link for it if you want to go look. Yeah, yeah. if you could also send an email to the members list, I'd be interested, I'd be interested in looking at that. Okay, I'll, I'll send a, I'll send a, uh, I'll send out the, the link to the to that little article that I did. And here's the build list for it. Cool. For sort of the build the build log I did. It was not not real extensive, but you know, classic Newtonian. I don't think uh, a lot of folks you know need a lot of details. Um, for testing the mirror, I did find uh, there, there's a guy out on cloudy nights who wrote a program that will allow you to take your DSLR and set it up in place of your eye behind the tester, the Pocault tester. And you'll take just a series of photographs by, after moving the knife in, edge uh, 
I started inside radius and then moved to the outside radius. And so you move it ever, you know, five or six thousandths of an inch and snap a photo and move it another five or six thousandths of an inch and snap a photo and dump it into this photo. And then it will go do the so-called analysis for you and give you a shape of the figure of the mirror. And I found that to be much more reliable uh, than, than using these old eyeballs that are full of floaters when going in and trying to, to read the zones on the mirror. And I'll, I'll see if I can find a link to that, to that article on cloudy nights and send it out as well. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else have their hand up would like to show some images? Uh, I see Steve Christensen. Sorry if I butchered your name. You wanna go ahead? Yeah, okay. Uh, find the screen here. Okay, back there. All right, this is, what, this is what Chris mentioned. I'm doing a huge mosaic of the Cygnus area and then moving beyond that. This is uh, 40 hydrogen alpha panels taken over the last month from my driveway. I'm using a uh, ATIC 460X camera, uh, Astrodon 5 nanometer filters, and a uh, Rokinon 135 millimeter uh, lens at f4. And so every night I look, it's clear, I go out and I take a few panels and then move on to the next night. The panels are mostly between one hour or maybe four hours in some cases of exposure, depending on what part of the sky I'm looking at. And so the goal is to do this entire area completely covered. Uh, and I can, I don't know if I, yeah, I can, the idea is to be able to zoom in on these uh, to look, so there's the veil. Uh, so all these are individual pictures, all uh, mosaic together. And there's butterfly and there's satyr, there's the crescent down there. And then all the way down here is the tulip. And then move up to the North American and Pelican. And if you move up here a little ways, this area right here, there's something called the flying dragon. You can just barely see the wings of it right there. That's a very dim object. You know, I, I did about three hours in this area, and that's what I got from it. So it's very dim. And so then I'm up here, then if you go, there's the cocoon nebula. And there's a lot of these uh, sharpless and uh, NGC objects in here in various places. And the propeller that Chris mentioned is, I think, down here, right there. All right. And then I just decided to keep going up this direction because I, I had some images of the uh, of the elephant trunk and the flying bat here. And so then in the next last few nights, I've been going up this direction. And there's lots of more sharpless things and, and NGC objects up this way. And then finally, you get up here. And there's the lobster and the bubble is right there and the cave nebula is right there. And so the goal of this is to be able to zoom in like this on these things, then you can go all the way out. So tonight when the meeting is over, I'm going to go in and fill this area in here and maybe try over here, depending on how the trees uh, work for me. But it's been a lot of fun to do this. Now, if I was to print this out, I calculated if I was to print this out, it would be about 15 feet wide and 12 feet tall, a sort of normal resolution print. And maybe I'll do that eventually, make a banner or something. I don't know. We'll see. But this, this whole area is kind of going down in the trees now for where I live. So I don't know how much I'll be able to finish until it's not possible to do it. All right. This is the California Nebula I've done in the last week or so. Uh, in the, in HA, oxygen and sulfur. And every year I make a, a holiday card that has some image that I've done that I send out to family and friends. And so this is what my holiday card is gonna be this year. And this is a, probably about six hours of exposure. The previous thing is probably 60 hours now for the mosaic. And then this is the elephant trunk again in, in the narrow band with the stars taken out. 
This is done about two weeks ago now, I guess. And this is, uh, I think some people call this the monkey skull, but I think it's NGC 7822. And sometimes I just like to make things colorful. So I make it really bright and colorful, highly saturated. And this is the, this is the close up of the veil nebula that went into that new mosaic. So all the different uh, images in that mosaic. <laughs> But of course, it's much smaller and it looks much smaller in the mosaic. And then there's the North American and Pelican, also the, the one that is in the mosaic. And then this is the Lion Nebula. Uh, this is a pretty dim object, too. This is probably about four or five hours of exposure to get this. And then uh, this is, um, I forget what this is, another sharp list, I think 126. This is very dim. This is probably six hours of exposure in two, two different filters, so hydrogen and oxygen. And so I just, I like to try to do these things that are pretty dim just to see what I can get. Uh, and then there's the, the flying bat. Now there's something called the squid nebula within this flying bat area here that's mostly oxygen. But so far I've been done, done like six hours of imaging of this area in oxygen and I can't, still can't see it. So I'm either doing something wrong or I just need a lot more hours in order to see the squid in there. Uh, and then this is Andromeda from my driveway. This is just to see if I could get it with a 135 millimeter uh, lens. Uh, and so it's got a lot of noise and stuff like that, but it's kind of fun to once in a while try something other than a narrow band image. And with this, I think I used my 074 ASI camera uh, on it just to see what I could get. Uh, so mostly I'm doing narrow band and working on that mosaic right now. I did the Orion mosaic last year and now I'm doing Cygnus and the area around Cygnus this year. So that's all I've got. Okay, we had a question for Ann. She asked, how long did it take you to do the, 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 the uh, Cygnus project? So far? So, uh, so, long, uh, so far. Uh, so far, well, it's 40 images. Uh, Probably about a month, I guess, maybe a month and a half, something like that. So uh, I go out every, I, the last four or five nights I've been out for eight hours. Uh, but the Cygnus goes down about 1 a.m. I can't do anything more in that area. So that's when I moved up to the California Nebula because I had a couple more hours I could work on on that. And tonight I'll go back out and do more of the Cygnus area and try to fill in those more panels. Uh, and you know it's it's a fair I mean it's about as much time processing it as it is actually gathering the data, you know, processing each one of the panels and matching them up with all the others. So, but it's a lot of fun. It's interesting. Chris asked the total time for the Cygnus image. Total time for the Cygnus image is probably sixty hours. Sixty hours. Roughly, okay. I haven't actually calculated it, but. Given I have 40 and some of them were one hour and some of them were four hours, I think it's, I haven't calculated, about, about 60, I would think. Okay. That, that doesn't include uh, actually processing afterwards. It's probably another 60 hours of processing. Yeah, I noticed your holiday image looks a little bit like a flaming dumpster fire. That's a good choice for 2020. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Okay, uh, do we have anyone else who wants to raise their hand and uh, present some images? Uh, uh, there's a, quite a few people who are off on video, so I can't see your hands. Uh, I've got some, I'll show. Okay, great, Jim. Please go ahead. All right, so I'm not actually blue, but I am on a cheap Walmart laptop, which makes me look blue. Share my screen. So uh, I joined the Raleigh Astronomy Club, uh, I guess, in February of 2019. And I joined the imaging group about that same time, and I was just kind of blown away when I saw what uh, Steve Goodman and Steve Christensen and uh, Chris Cole and the other members of the group were doing. Um, so I've been really excited to get into it. I'm uh, still doing DSLR images. I uh, haven't got myself a dedicated uh, astrophotography camera yet, so I'm still doing uh, DSLR, uh, which, uh, as uh, Steve Christensen was showing you, has some disadvantages when I'm shooting in Raleigh. I do do some imaging in Raleigh. Um, but where it does really well is uh, in dark sites. So I've really enjoyed taking it to 
some dark places and uh, seeing what it can do when I get somewhere dark. So this first image, uh, this is uh, late last summer uh, at Mount Rainier in Washington State. And so uh, we were uh, up there in Seattle and uh, checked uh, Astrophuric app or whichever app I was using at the time. And I saw it was a really clear night and my wife was willing to drive down to Rainier with me. So we took a trip down to Rainier and we hiked out into the cold uh, out to a place called uh, Sunrise Point. Uh, and it was pitch black. It's, I've been to a couple places where you look up and it's hard to find Polaris because you just see so many stars. And this is one of those places where it, this uh, sky was just full of stars. Um, so I made a good place to take this image. So this is with uh, a Tamron uh, 15 to 30 uh, wide angle lens on a full frame DSLR. I had a sky tracker, uh, which thankfully uh, I was a beginner and I just got lucky and forgot to turn it on for at least one frame, which allowed me to have a foreground that wasn't blurred, uh, but got me some nice images of the Milky Way. All right, so this next one is not an astrophotography image, but I just wanted to say the next place I went uh, was in South Texas. This was uh, December of last year. And in South Texas, there's a place called, the Mar uh, called Marathon. And this is the Marathon Motel. And if you ever want to take an astronomy trip, this is a great place to go. Uh, it's a Bortle One site, and in the back of the motel, they've got a little sky park. Uh, there's an astronomer who goes out there every night with a 24-inch dob, who will give you a little tour of the sky with his 24-inch dob. And they've got uh, these little concrete pads where you can uh, set up your scope and do some imaging or do some viewing. Uh, they've got power going out to each of the pads, uh, and it's just a really neat place uh, to do some imaging. And so while I was there, I took uh, this image of Orion. Um, and what's really neat about these dark sites is you can really see the molecular cloud there. So you can see all the molecular cloud around Orion. Um, you can see a uh, horse head nebula and the Orion nebula. This is with a 200 millimeter lens uh, on the Canon full frame. Uh, so it really uh, gives you a nice kind of view of all the, all the dust around Orion. Uh, this is about three hours of imaging uh, that I did that night. Um, and then probably several days of processing when I got home. Uh, this next one is also while we were down in Texas. Um, in the near Marathon is a place called Trilinga. And we were staying in a, a Airbnb there. And it is a totally dark site. It is Bortle 1 with no light pollution at all. Um, and I was able to just go out the front door, <clears throat> set up the scope. And uh, what I did was uh, I shot a three panel mosaic using that wide angle Tamron um, uh, of the Milky Way. So on the left side is the west horizon. And on the east side, at the, or on the right side is the east horizon. I think you can just make out a little piece of land <clears throat> in that right corner. Um, so you get the entire sky in this one picture. Um, and so if you look over in this region over here, uh, you have that Cygnus region uh, that Steve is uh, imaging. Um, over up top here, you've got Andromeda. I think that's probably Triangulum up there. Uh, there's the Sol Nebula. You've got California floating over here, and uh, Pleiades. And way over here on the right-hand side, you've got Orion. Uh, and there's just a close-up I did of Andromeda. So uh, recently I've been shooting up in Virginia up at Smith Mountain Lake. It's Bortle 4. Uh, and so I can do uh, some much uh, sort of faster imaging than I can in Raleigh. I took a picture like this of Andromeda in Raleigh. It took me about six hours to collect the data. Uh, this was just me messing around with 19 minutes of data uh, on the roof of a boathouse. Um, and so it just kind of blew me away. Like, uh, with a little bit darker skies, I can really collect some good data. And while I was here, I shot Orion again. This time, uh, this is using a 350 millimeter uh, lens. It's actually an astrograph uh, refractor. Um, it's f5, not quite as fast as my 200 millimeter, uh, but took a nice uh, sharp image. Um, this was at the end of a night of imaging where I started with uh, uh, the Trifid Nebula hit the helix, did uh, Triangulum Galaxy, and then got this. So 
a dark site, I can really get a lot more imaging done in a shorter period of time. And uh, it's another one of these uh, starless images. Uh, so the software nowadays allows you really just to remove the stars with a click of a button, click of a button, and then go do something else because it's going to take it about 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, but uh, that allows you to kind of see what the image would look like without the stars. It gives you kind of a different view of Orion here uh, with the stars removed. Uh, this is a, one I did recently of the Iris Nebula, uh, again in the dark site, which allows you to see uh, not just the nebula itself, but some of the dustier areas around it. And uh, while I was shooting in that uh, region in uh, Cepheus, I also uh, shot the Shark Nebula. You probably can guess how that got its name. Uh, but it's got this nice little dark nebula here, which makes the eye, uh, and then some uh, faint molecular clouds, uh, which kind of happen to just form a shark body. Uh, uh, I might make this one my Christmas card, Steve. I think it's got with a uh, little halos around the stars. It might be a good Christmas card. Uh, and then this is the, the Pleiades, uh, which I also shot uh, up at Smith Mountain Lake. Um, so I'm trying to mess around with the stars on this one, get it to come out a little better. But again, uh, I've shot this in Raleigh and I couldn't get this much detail uh, in this amount of time uh, when, when I'm shooting up in Virginia. And let's see here. I'll show you a little movie. So this was kind of a happy accident. Um, I set up my scope to shoot more of the shark nebula and I came out to find it instead of pointing north where it should have been aimed, it was pointing south. But I had good guiding and then I'd taken 27 frames. So I was kind of curious to see what I got. And so I did some plate solving and it said uh, there's an asteroid in there, uh, a minor planet named Borega 554. Um, and uh, with using some, and then just kind of flipping through the images, you can kind of see the asteroids. So if you look for where that green circle appears, you'll see a little green, you'll see a little white dot there. And uh, that's the minor planet uh, kind of wandering as planets do. Um, so it's out in the main asteroid belt. It's about the size of Delaware and it takes somewhere uh, just over a thousand days uh, to orbit the sun. And just uh, one last thing. This is something that I did last weekend. Um, this again is at Smith Mountain Lake. And one of the things I can do with a DSLR is I can just set it to do a series of images uh, and make a little time lapse. And so this is uh, looking off my dock. Uh, it's a partly cloudy night, which is ideal for doing time lapses because I couldn't do much else imaging with it. You see the Pleiades, you'll eventually see Orion rise over on the right. Here comes Orion. We'll play that again. So that's about what I got. Okay, thanks. Some beautiful images. And we have a couple of questions. Uh, one is from David. He asked if uh, these were taken with a modified camera, i.e. did you remove the IR filter? No, um, it's, a, it's a stock camera. Uh, it's, a, it's a full frame. So when I, when, when I do get nebula, they usually don't show up for some reason with a wide angle, uh, like California will show up. Um, and with that Orion one, you can begin to see uh, some of the hydrogen alpha areas in Orion. Uh, I don't know if it's something about a wide angle lens, just allowing in more light that allows it to pick it up, but uh, it, it's just a stock camera. Okay, we had another question from Mary. Is uh, Marathon, Texas an official dark sky site? Uh, I don't think it has an official dark sky site designation, but it's right next to one. So Big Bend National Park uh, is an international dark sky site. Um, and so sort of marathon is where you stay when you're going to Big Bend. And that's a, another great place to image from. And that's has also zero light pollution. Okay. Uh, John just posted, uh, if anyone's interested in um, uh, uh, imaging for, or, or going to marathon, uh, he knows people he can set you up with uh, to help, help you uh, organize that. It's a great place. All right, well, thank you. Is there uh, anyone else who uh, is interested in uh, showing some images? 
I don't see the gallery here. What do I do? Uh, show gallery. I just want to stop sharing. Yeah. Is there anyone else who'd like to uh, show some images? Okay, uh, Andy, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. Is that working? Okay, cool. Um, so this is a crescent nebula. I took this, this is my first narrowband image. I took this um, probably two and a half years ago now when I first joined the imaging club and got my gear. Um, I was probably here for like six months before I actually got any gear going on. So uh, I believe this is, was, I think this was a HOO. It was only two, two bands. Um, but uh, you've seen crescent in a couple of previous pictures. This is just uh, the one that I took of it. Um, let's see here. Next one is Horsehead Nebula. Everybody recognizes that. Um, you can also see my starburst pattern in the upper left coming from probably Altenac, something bouncing around in my gear, but uh, I still like the picture. I haven't quite figured out what's causing that yet, um, but it's not too often that I'm imaging super bright stars, so I haven't really spent the time to try and get rid of that, but uh, this is uh, an RGB image. I took this, I believe I was at uh, Jordan Lake when I took this, or Big Woods, rather. The previous one was from my driveway in Cary. Uh, this is uh, IC443. Um, trying to remember, this was, I think this may have been a, a two-band image as well. Uh, also narrow band. This was from my <coughs> house here in Cary. Um, this was, I'm trying to remember if this was, the, the previous two were with a 90-millimeter refractor running at a, 475 millimeter. I can't remember if this was my 200 millimeter lens or that refractor. Uh, I don't have all the notes on the images to answer that. I think this was a 200 millimeter. Um, this is uh, M33. Uh, again, this is an RGB image. Um, I have a mono camera. Basically, when I say RGB, I'm taking, taking multiple pictures through a red, green, or blue filter. Whereas with the narrowband filters I'm uh, using for the narrowband images, I'm taking them through narrowband filters. Uh, next up is uh, Orion. This was uh, also taken out at uh, Big Woods, I believe. Um, most of my RGB images are taken from either Big Woods or Jordan Lake or a boat ramp or something like that because there's less light pollution than from my house. Uh, this is one of my favorite images that I've taken. Of course, I've always loved looking at Orion, so <laughs> kind of uh, biased. Uh, this is uh, M63. I, this is one of my, I think this is one of the first attempts of taking an image through my um, SCT. Uh, I haven't done a lot of imaging through it yet. Um, it took me a while to kind of get that set up for imaging because I had to take it off of their forks. Uh, it came uh, something I bought like 20 years ago. I had to take it off the forks, put it on my German equatorial mount. Um, this was one of my first attempts with that. This is the Pleiades. Um, everybody should recognize that one. Uh, another starburst pattern in the upper right there. <laughs> uh, I think this might have been from my uh, house. I can't. I can't remember this one. Um, it's been a while, but uh, it's bright enough that you can you can get stuff like that from your house. But it's either there or from Jordan Lake. Um, and uh, this is the Rosette Nebula. This is also through my refractor. This is an airband image, so all the colors are made up. Um, I, can't, I think this was a standard SHO arrangement where sulfur goes to red and hydrogen goes to green and oxygen goes to blue. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is the, the arrangement of those colors. But uh, with narrowband imaging, it's kind of fun. You can pick any colors you want. If you like bright orange or purple or whatever, you can do it. Um, this is also one of my favorite images of, that I have. Uh, this is a, a hydrogen alpha image. Um, of uh, the Saturn region, uh, one of the this is like a really small area within Steve Christensen's big mosaic. Um, I didn't realize that the propeller was around this, but it's not in this frame, so I'm gonna have to go looking for it at some point. Um, I plan to do a a color image of this region, but all I got while uh, the skies were clear was hydrogen alpha, and then we had some clouds for a period of time, and now that they went away. This is now behind trees. So I've been imaging other things this past week. 
uh, haven't processed them yet, so I don't have them to show today, but, but I do plan to take some other images of this and the other bands and get a, get a color image out of it. Um, this is uh, the veil, uh, another narrow band image. This is uh, just two bands, uh, probably H and O. And uh, that's all of them. Just um, grabbed a couple of the images that I like out of my small collection for the, for the meeting. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. I don't see any questions. Steve uh, posted a link to uh, Marathon Sky Park. Uh, if you want, to, if you're interested, you can check the chat. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to present? I've got a few. Okay, Johnny, please go ahead. Okay. Um. And, uh, everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a couple of rocket launches. This is up back on November the 5th, a uh, picture from my backyard. Uh, a Falcon 9 uh, rocket launched a uh, classified payload for the Space Force back on November the 9th. It was a, a night launch. And uh, I wasn't able to find out if, uh, if it was going right up the East Coast. So I just hung out in the backyard and uh, here it comes. Uh, this is a uh, with a, a Nikon D750 DSLR with an 80 to 200 millimeter lens on a tripod, and the, the zoom setting was like 150 millimeters, and it's a three second exposure, so you can see how much uh, travel the uh, the rocket made in those three seconds. But uh, it's pretty cool to watch. It was uh, it was V shaped. Someone said it looked like the Starfleet emblem, but. Uh, the, uh, the lower component of the V was longer and brighter than the upper one. I could tell that uh, just looking at it in the sky and the photo bears it out. Um, in a, uh, let's see. And I have this, uh, this video, Are you able to see that? Still there? Yep. Okay. All right. And uh, this uh, video, if I can get it to play, this is uh, the uh, Atlas rocket launch just a few nights ago, um, which was uh, going to go up the East Coast. And um, it, uh, um, this is it coming over. Uh, it was in twilight. But the launch occurred a little later than, you, than it was scheduled to, so I didn't have a lot of sunlight on it. But there's some staging coming up here that's really cool to, to watch, uh, just as it was uh, getting pretty high in the sky. There you go. And the, uh, the, the two uh, components after that are seen to uh, you know, get further apart uh, for the rest of the video. As, uh, as the booster and the upper stage you know, travel together. Um, this is with a, a Nikon D750 and a 300 millimeter F2.8 lens. And a friend of mine loaned me this nice uh, fluid head video tripod. So uh, there it is going by background star. But uh, it was really, really cool to see and uh, uh, it, it appeared in the wrong place uh, in the sky. It didn't well. It didn't appear where I was looking. It, uh, I was looking more southeast, and it came right out of the south. And uh, by the time it uh, I acquired it, it was already in in shadow. But uh, there's the two components uh, uh, going by there. Uh, got a couple of uh, lunar images from uh, the last month or so. Um, this is Sidus Iridum and Plato over on the right, uh, the last quarter moon, uh, you know, about two weeks ago. Um, this is with a monochrome uh, uh, 16 megapixel camera. Uh, it's a lucky imaging thing where it's the best 200 out of about a thousand frames. Uh, and it was uh, stacked in auto stackered and sharpened in Registax. And this the same same camera, same process. This is Kepler and Copernicus and Eratosthenes. 
again, the third quarter moon. Uh, third quarter moon's almost directly overhead this time of year at dawn, so seeing was pretty good. And uh, uh, so these are these are both monochrome images with uh, you know the lucky imaging uh, uh, procedures. And this is Mars from uh, I think the fifth uh, of October, or, or the, I'm sorry, the the twenty twenty sixth of October. Uh, and this is through my Mead 14 inch ACF uh, Schmidt Cassegrain and a uh, ASI 290 one shot color camera. Uh, this is uh, about the sharpest Mars I was going to get this, uh, this apparition. Uh, as Chris said, you know, the seeing's key and the seeing was really bad most of the time. But uh, uh, this shows uh, Valley Marineris near the center there. And this is one on the 5th, uh, October 5th, uh, same, same scope, same camera. Uh, so uh, anyhow, I, I shot a lot of Mars pictures this time, but they were, for the most part, very soft. It was, uh, it was all about the seeing. And uh, I used uh, the atmospheric dispersion corrector uh, on it, even even though Mars was 50, 55 degrees high, I still used the ADC unit there, and it really it really seemed to sharpen them up when I used it versus uh, uh, going without it. So, uh, you know, but there were so many so many nights that it was very high in the sky, but that didn't that didn't help the seeing. It was it was pretty uh, uh, pretty rough seeing. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Uh, uh, I don't see any yet. Thank you very much. Those are beautiful images. With the first rocket, uh, what was the date on that Falcon 9? That was uh, November 5th. It was the one, uh, it was an unmanned classified payload for the Space Force. So Remember it was probably Space going to polar orbit. Yeah. Hey, sure. It was right off. Uh, Right off the coast, and it was the same track that I used to see the shuttle launches uh, go uh, when they were going to the ISS. Okay. Same part of the sky, the same arc okay. from southeast to northeast. And it was maybe 20 degrees high in the east when this picture was made. Did you happen to get a chance to see the the uh, Crew Dragon launch? It, it was too cloudy and carry. It was overcast. It was overcast here. Uh, some friends of mine saw it from Kinston. It was very clear there, and they said it was wonderful to see uh, arc across the sky there. Uh, Andy asked, how difficult is it to adjust the ADC? Um, the uh, uh, fire capture has a little widget in there that you can uh, 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 enable, and it will give you a red circle and a blue circle that dances around with the seeing. And you can um, uh, you adjust the two levers on the ADC. Uh, to bring those two circles together or to the extent that you can uh, in the seeing. And that's the way I've been doing it. Um, and then you just, uh, you just index those positions and torque them down and uh, you're, you're good to go. But it made a lot of difference. Even when I couldn't see any fringe, any color fringing around Mars on the screen, it would still show up in the video, you know, but using the ADC really cleaned that up. Um, but um, I, I haven't used it that much. I've only, I've had it about a year or so and I've used it on Jupiter and Saturn since they're very low in the sky. But I thought, you know, Mars is gonna be so high, you know, I, I won't need the ADC. Well, uh, it, it really helped even though Mars was high. It didn't help the seeing, but it helped the, you know, the color dispersion. How, how big, uh, what's the aperture of the ADC? I mean, is it limited to a certain camera size? Yeah, it's an inch and a quarter. There are two little wedge prisms in there and it has a, I don't know, a, a 16 or 20 millimeter aperture in there that the, uh, that the light goes through. Um, very, very small units. It's, uh, it's made, the one I have is made by ZWO. But it's, it's helpful when the planet is low. It can really uh, uh, 
null that uh, that atmospheric dispersion, the other red on one edge, blue on the other. Um, anything else? Any other questions? I uh, don't see anything. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, do we have anyone else who'd like to show some, show something? Yeah, Steve, I'm happy to, to show some uh, screen grabs of EAA work. Okay, you don't even show up on my gallery. Well, uh, yeah, you have your camera on. Well, even I if do. you didn't. But yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Steve, you need to change how many people show up on the screen. If you go to the view button, the view button will show more people. Okay. Um, wait, I gotta stop one second. Apologies. Start again. All right. Share. Window. Video mode. Okay. Hopefully, I you guys can see what I'm sharing now. Um, so this this first view is um, from an older um, uh, CCD camera. This was about 20 seconds total of exposure of the Eagle Nebula, uh, a rather uh, small resolution uh, picture. I mean, the, 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 the pixels on this are really, it's only about, uh, what is it, 640 across and 480 down. Um, so it's a pretty, this is what a, a very simple CCD um, uh, camera for EAA or video astronomy um, will do. Uh, then we'll jump to a uh, picture of the same object, the Eagle Nebula, uh, but this is with a, a newer CMOS camera. Um, and this is, uh, all of these are going to be a little less than five minutes of, of capture time. This is exactly as I saw it on my screen and just did a screen save. There's no processing um, after the fact, so it is literally as I saw it. Um, so this is the uh, Eagle Nebula. A great summertime object. Um, this is the Dumbbell uh, Nebula M27. And this one, um, you can see this was a case of the uh, focus being a little soft. I've got some uh, little, little donuts here. I am using a very aggressive uh, focal reducer uh, so I can get the image, uh, a w wide enough image um, of the sky or increase the, the actual field of view. Uh, so again, this is exactly as I saw it. Um, this is, uh, again, um, this was late uh, in Staunton River Star Party of 2019, just as we were getting into some clouds. Uh, again, this focus is a little uh, soft here. Um, I've actually had to, uh, I've actually decided to get a better focusing routine. Um, so uh, it's easier to uh, make the adjustments for focus during the night. Uh, but this is the Triangulum Galaxy M33. Uh, you can see here, I, um, I haven't subtracted um, a, a good uh, a bunch of darks from this because I've got some hot pixels and you can see uh, they've hopped around as, uh, and these are these blue streaks here and these uh, green streaks here. Uh, so as the, the software was uh, stacking and aligning the um, uh, the different images. You can see as the, you know the, basically how it's been smeared a little bit. Um, this is the Sculptor Galaxy, um, and again, uh, you know, need to update my dark library. And uh, this was before I cleaned uh, my camera. Uh, had a little uh, few uh, dust bunnies sitting in the. Uh, on the lens. Um, this one's a little hard to see. I think this is a little more, but this is the Helix Nebula or the Eye of God, uh, I think as it's called. Uh, this one was really hard to, to pick up. Um, this I actually tried to get uh, from um, my house here in Apex and really, really tried to, uh, in fact, I think I did close to eight or nine minutes trying to get this. Uh, and it's just really hard to um, tease out the, the nebulosity from the background uh, sky. Uh, it was just so bright, but you can start to see uh, what it looks like. 
um, from that perspective. Uh, this is uh, M51, uh, the Whirlpool uh, Galaxy. This is another one from uh, my house here in Apex. So again, battling with some um, um, you know, brighter uh, skies in the background, uh, but you can get to see uh, definitely that uh, background galaxy um, as well as some of the star forming regions within the arms uh, of the galaxy. And then this is, I've actually, all those were taken with my uh, 11 inch um, uh, SCT. Uh, these next views were all taken with my four inch um, refractor and it is an achromatic um, uh, scope. So uh, you'll see the false color around these bright stars. Um, but uh, here's the Orion Nebula. Um, and this same view uh, focus was definitely a little bit off on this one, um, but this was uh, taken from a, a darker sky site. Um, but this is the Horsehead Nebula with uh, uh, Alan Attack really, really bright there in the corner and the uh, Flame Nebula uh, off to the side. That's always fun to just be able to just boom and, and, and you, you've got it. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to show an example of uh, what you can do even with a, a you know, kind of a simple uh, refractor, an alt as mount, and just an iPhone. Um, so that is uh, this video clip. Um, so you can see here, it is shaking a little bit. Um, so I'm just kind of turning it. I'm actually now using the zoom feature with the, uh, uh, with the iPhone. Um, it's just clamped onto the eyepiece and able to take some uh, nice video uh, of the moon. And again, there's no tracking, no nothing, um, just uh, an eyepiece and a cell phone. And I just love this angle that I had gotten there. Um, jump forward just a little bit. And you can see that it has some chromatic aberration here. You can see that kind of on the, the, the limb of the moon, it's very you know purplish, almost like electroluminescent. Uh, and all I'm doing is basically letting the moon um, kind of move um, uh, through the, the field of view of the eyepiece um, and just doing slight adjustments. So it, it, it's almost like I'm panning, but the reality is the, the I'm not tracking at all. I'm just letting um, the object move through the field of view. And I love this little uh, object here where you can see it almost looks like some kind of canal going into this crater that's still uh, in the, the shadow. Um, so that is it. Uh, the phase, uh, I see it's one of the questions. Um, that was near um, full moon, uh, I think. So definitely, it, it was almost positive it was a, uh, a waxing gibbous, um, you know, almost near full moon. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, I have the free Linux client. I have no idea how to figure out how to increase my gallery. So if, if anyone is would, would like to show some images, please unmute and speak up. I, I've, got some, I've, I've got some images I can show. This is Rob. Okay, Rob, please go ahead. Well, just uh, share my screen. Uh, I think so, yeah. Oh, it won't, it doesn't like, hold on a second. Rob, are you trying to share with an iPad? Uh, with a, with a computer, with a, a laptop. Okay. I just have to allow it. Oh, I can't, Never mind. I have to quit Zoom to do it. 
It's okay. I'll just sit here and keep panning myself when my son is out of here. Go ahead and do it. I'll be back. Okay, who was it that just spoke up a minute ago? Uh, I I mentioned I could. Okay, Warren, please go ahead. All right, that's showing. Does that show? Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, this this will be pretty brief. Um, I got started doing photography, astrophotography in about 2016. And this was one of my first attempts uh, doing Andromeda. Um, and when I've had time, I've been learning. So second thing I went after was uh, M81 and M82. And so the, the first two uh, images here were with a uh, Canon 6D and a 1 to 400 uh, EF L lens, and then uh, this was also with the uh, with the same lens, but with a uh, 7D Mark II. And uh, I mean, obviously, everybody knows when this was. Um, and uh, was a, I went down to uh, South Carolina and was able to get these shots from the eclipse. And then uh, more recently, I, I took another crack at doing deep sky with uh, with the. Uh, uh, Andromeda, or the, not the Andromeda, um, Orion's Belt, um, uh, focusing in on that. I had, I had a family request for one for a print, so I, I had to get a better shot than the one I tinkered around with before. So, uh, so I did that. That was, that was the first time I really tried to do deep space, uh, deep sky stuff seriously. Um, and then this was, uh, last year I went on my, uh, my company gives uh, sabbatical time off to do uh, charity work, and I went over to Mongolia. And uh, I don't know if, if I don't know if there's a Bortle Zero category, but given that the closest civilization was six hours away by vehicle, um, it was the darkest skies I've seen anywhere. Um, and uh, I had packed my star tracker with my uh, SLR, so uh, I was able to at least get a few shots uh, before I collapsed in exhaustion at the end of the day. Um, but just gorgeous skies. Um, and then mo most recently, I've got an 11 inch SCT that I'm starting to learn to use. So I've been playing with trying to do planetary stuff here in North Carolina, which I'm sure everyone who's tried to do that is aware of the seeing issues and how much fun I'm having learning. Um, so Jupiter and of course, Mars. So that's it for me. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. They look good. Uh, are you good to go, Rob? Yeah, I'm back. I'll try it again. Okay. So this is um, some screen grabs from EAA, you know, what Michael was talking about up in uh, Staunton River. This is like my first attempt to do any type of EAA out of my uh, eight inch, um, my H edge. Castlegranian with a, um, a color camera. So this is maybe 20, 30 seconds of, of frames of, of Orion. Um, this is one night's viewing. I was just moving around between targets. Um, I think this is the bubble nebula um, that I went after after I went after Orion's. Um, this is a 1440 seconds of, of total total imaging, maybe, maybe 10, 15 frames um, using sharp cap. And then um, Went after, um, I think that's M82. Um, I think it's, I got M81 and M82. I was going to those two different targets that night. Um, and I believe this is M81. I had a little bit of coloring problem. I was try, playing with, with sharp cap, which is the tool. Um, but you can see this is about a thousand seconds of uh, frames, about 15, 20 seconds of frame. And then my last one was, uh, was the horse head. I had a lot of problems. I think someone else was talking about a really bright star over there on the left. I think that's, I forget the name of that star. It's, it's in the um, Orion Nebula, really bright. So I was trying to move the scope over to the right um, to get a better picture of the horse head. And just as I was about ready to do that, all these clouds came in. So this, this set of frames was a longer frames, but I had clouds. And so 
um, the scope was tracking an EAA, throwing away all the frames that had clouds in it. And then every once in a while, a cloud would clear and I get one frame with no cloud. Um, and so over those 3000, I did it for maybe an hour or so. And I got about, I don't know, about 10, 15 frames between the shooting between the clouds, which I thought was pretty funny. And noticing that my scope was uh, tracking pretty well that night. So um, anyway, that was kind of fun because we never went to look at it. It was really, it was, it was clouded and it was dark, but yet I was getting some frames through the clouds as they would just kind of part for a few seconds. Anyway, that's what I have. <laughs> okay, thanks. I think Mar Romero asked, uh, where is the dark sky site? Where did I shoot that from? Yeah. Oh, that was Staunton oh. River. That was Staunton, Staunton River. Yeah. I, I think the question was uh, for, for Warren. Okay. When he was in the dark sky where he was in Mongolia. Oh, oh okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, that was... Um, Wow, it was, uh, well, it was the Ignart Nature Reserve. So it was just literally in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's a national preserve that's uh, for studying the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Argali sheep and uh, Ibex and a few other species. And it's in partnership with the Denver Zoo and uh, Earthwatch. Do you know about how, uh, what the altitude is? I want to say it's about, 5,000 feet, yeah. I'd have to check, but it's, it's, it's enough up there to where it's a little bit thin, but with the desert atmosphere, I mean, there's, there's no water for miles and it is dry as a bone. So it's, it was extremely good skies to look at. Okay, uh, is there anyone else you'd like to present? If, 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 if so, please just unmute and speak up. Okay, well, if, if, if that's it, folks, thank you very much. Those are a lot of great images. We really appreciate a lot of hard work that went into those. And uh, thank you very much. And